Today we're going to talk about descriptive epidemiological studies. I'm Gerilyn Cambrin, your course instructor. There are four different factors that we would like to assess in study designs. And we'll go through each of these individually. The first is sampling of populations. Next, outcome measures. We then have timing of measures. And finally, if the study is an experimental or an observational study design. In every research study, we have to talk about how are we going to sample the population. We want to make sure that we get enough people in our research studies. And so the first thing we have to do is think about, well, who's our target population? Who is it that we are interested in studying? And where do we find them? And the problem is that not everyone in the target population is accessible. And so we also have to look at, well, who's in the accessible population? So who actually fit our criteria for entry into the study and who's accessible as a pool of subjects? And so sometimes those two um, populations are not actually the same, but we hope that they are close enough that when we're comparing the accessible population or the sample in our study to the target population that it is close enough. This is just a, um, a graphic of what it looks like. So when we take a sample from the population in order to do our research study, so this is like our research sample, we assume that we can infer those results back to the entire population. It's not always true, but that's what we hope to do in research. And so as you look at data, you have to think about, okay, you know, here's what the data say, but can we trust that this sample truly is representative of the full population, uh, target population that we wanted to study? If not, we have what's called a sampling bias. And so what happens in a sampling bias is we are over-representing by some characteristic or under-representing by some characteristic. And this can cause um, real problems. For example, if we were interested in talking about, let's say, access to health care, and the way that we are surveying people is by standing in front of a, a medical clinic, we may be sampling people who have access to health care and not talking to or, or um, sampling from people who don't have access to health care. And so really we have to think about where did these patients come from? Uh, that might be a real obvious example, but um, there's lots of different other examples that you know, we really have to consider, such as there's volunteer bias. When people volunteer for a study, those folks are sometimes very different from those who don't volunteer. I mean, think about in, um, in class, when the teacher asks a question and somebody keeps raising their hand, what type of student is that typically? And are they representative of the whole class, you know, the, the whole target population being the whole class, or are they very different or, you know, just representing a sub-segment of people who know the answers, who are um, not shy and willing to raise their hand, and so really we when we do research, we have to consider, is there a sampling bias in, in our studies? And how might that affect the results? The word generalizability is used quite frequently in research, and I just want to make sure that you're aware of what that means. It, when, some, um, when the study results are generalizable, what that means is that the results you got in the study can then be directly inferred back to the full target population. When, you, when the results of the study are not representative of the full target population, well then we say that a study is not generalizable. Does that make sense? And so we really have to think about, well, who's the target population? And then who was in our research study? And can we take the results from the research study, from our sample in the research study, and generalize them back to the target population? Sometimes when people talk about generalizability, it refers more to um, your own private 
practice. So if you're a practitioner, whether it be a, a medical physician, a dentist, a vet, when you're reading a research article, you also have to think about can you generalize the results from that research article to the population of patients that you treat. For instance, if we're reading a research article looking at, um, let's say, dental care, and the study is from a very rural area, but you work in a very urban area, can you actually refer or generalize the results to your client population? Or if we're talking about, uh, let's say, lung disease, and the research study that we're reading is in a very is in a city that's at a very high altitude. Well, can you actually generalize those results to your lung patients who are not at a high altitude? And so sometimes you can, but not always. And so it's something that you also have to think about. Are the results from this sample population within this study generalizable to either your patients or to the target population? The second factor that we should look at are outcome measures. And so when we're reading a study, we have to think about what are they actually measuring in the study? And so most studies will look at demographic outcomes, and so things such as gender, age, race. But there's lots of other ways um, or other factors that can be measured, such as there's some self-reported. Anything that is a survey that the patient fills out with their opinion as to how much pain they have or disability, quality of life, or you know other factors like that that are all self-report. Um, how much anxiety do you have or other psychological aspects or where exactly do you feel the pain or what does the pain feel like is it tingly or numb or shooting or stabbing um, all of those things are self-report and so when we think about outcome measures we have to think about is it self-reported or is this something that is objective that we can actually measure there's also um, exposure related such as what is your diet like? What types of foods do you eat? How much exercise do you get? What, how much air pollution do you get? Now those things are also um, self-report perhaps, but they also can be measured. And so for instance, with exercise, either someone can report, I walk 10,000 steps a day, or they can actually get a device that they put on their belt um, loop and it actually measures. Same thing with air pollution, same thing with diet. We can actually follow people around with diet and um, write down everything that they're eating. Whereas with the self-report measures, we have no idea how much pain people actually have. That has to be self-reported. So there's also physiological or biological, the number four there, that's things like um, blood results or genetic tests or body mass index or, or even are they alive or not so much anymore? Uh, so there's lots of different ways that we can measure outcomes within research studies. Uh, the, the final one is performance-based, uh, walking distance, minutes per mile, you know, how many push-ups can someone do or how long can someone stand. These are just um, categories that I made up uh, based on my experience within research, but there's really so many different ways that we can categorize outcome measures. And the um, kind of the focus of this slide is to think about that we can measure so many different things within research studies. And so when you start reading research studies, you have to think about Hmm, uh, how did they measure that? How did they measure exercise? Did they actually ask the person or did they actually use a Fitbit or a Garmin or a job order, you know, something that actually measures the amount of movement that a person has? When we have outcome measures, there's also different ways that we can express the data. And so we have uh, in this table, you can see that there's categorical data and continuous data. And sometimes the same measure or the same factor that we're assessing can be expressed in many different ways. For example, uh, with pain, a lot of times we hear how much pain do you have on a zero to 10 scale with 10 being the worst pain imaginable. Okay, so now we have a continuous measure. 
but that continuous measure could also be put into a categorical form or ordinal form, such as, is your pain mild, moderate, or severe? Or we could actually take this pain level uh, that they report and transform the data into a categorical. And so for instance, if we collected data on a continuous scale of zero to 10, we might say, 0, 1, 2, 3 is mild, 4, 5, 6 is moderate, 7, 8, 9, 10 is severe. And so we can manipulate the data like that. Now we see age here, uh, I put 0 to 100 plus because some people live more than 100. Uh, we can separate those into different categories, youth, middle age, senior. You know, these again, there's lots of different ways that we can um, segment age. I just picked three different uh, categories. Uh, with temperature, we might see, you know, what exactly is their temperature on a continuous scale, or we can categor, categor, make it categorical, have it be normal or low or high. Uh, we can even make it dichotomous, have it be normal or abnormal, and when it's abnormal, we don't know, is it high or low? And then there's some things, such as marital status, there is no continuous data for marital status. It's, it's purely categorical. Is someone single, married, divorced, or widowed? Now, I'm sure there's um, combination categories with marital status, and I mean, that's kind of not the point with this, but I do want to acknowledge that some people can be uh, married, but also divorced or widowed and also married. So anyway, so I, uh, when we think about data, we have to think about, well, how is it collected and how is it actually expressed? The third factor is looking at timing of measures. Uh, people can get their measures in just one single time point, which is like a cross-sectional or a survey study, or we can follow people over time and keep measuring forward in time to see are things changing as we go forward. So as some examples, we can look at different um, measure levels of exposure. Our first question would be, what is the prevalence of underage drinking? Okay, so that's just a one-time measure that we would look at at one time point. Now, sure, we could look over time, but then the question would probably be, is there a change in prevalence of underage drinking? We also can look at what is the average number of drinks per month in different age groups. And so we could either measure that at one time point with lots of different age groups, or we can take a group of people and measure them over time. Now they're in their 20s, now they're in their 30s, now they're in their 40s. So it's the same people and we're following them forward. The third question, what is the percent of seniors who choose abstinence from alcohol? Again, that could be a one-time measure or it could be over time. Sometimes we look at levels of disease. So what is the prevalence of cirrhosis in adults? Um, again, that can be what is the change in prevalence of cirr cirrhosis in adults? Or what is the average age for diagnosis of liver cancer? Um, what is the percent of seniors uh, that take no prescription medications? Again, that could change over time or we could make that just a one-time measure. Now some studies will look at um, what might have caused the disease. So we might look at in people who have cirrhosis, what was the average number of drinks when they were in their 20s? Um, and so we are, you know, looking backwards, we're trying to see, okay, when they have the disease, what might have caused it? Or we can look forward when people have certain factors, will that possibly lead to a certain disease? These studies, this last group that I, I'm talking about, uh, what studies um, where we measure factors that might lead to disease, these are the ones that are very frequently prospective over time. So we're following people over time and looking at um, are they developing the disease or not? Are they changing how much they're exposed to or not? And so these are the ones that uh, are very frequently measured multiple times, not just a one-time measure. 
We can look at different um, study designs as well. Uh, initially, we will be talking about observational studies, which are descriptive studies, and that's where we're just really measuring um, people as they are. And we're not changing anything about their life or any um, exposure levels or therapies or anything like that. We're just letting them do whatever they do and just measuring it. Or we can look at experimental studies, which is a whole nother gamut. This is where we get into uh, randomized clinical trials and we start uh, influencing them either through specific treatments or exposures uh, to different hopefully positive things, sometimes negative things, and we see what happens over time. But the researcher is in charge of it, and therefore it's called an experiment. It's not people choosing to be um, in one group or the other, but rather the researcher is deciding, you get this to be in this group, and you get to be in that group, and here's what you're going to be doing. So a lot of times these observational studies happen first, and then we move on to the experimental studies. Just want to show you this hierarchy of study design. We see lots of different study designs. The uh, ones at the top are considered the strongest study designs. Those are, uh, especially the randomized controlled trials, are the experimental. Below that are more the descriptive and observational study designs. So in the future, we'll be talking about what are these different study designs, how are they different, and why are some stronger than others? But for now, what I want to say is that a lot of times research starts at the bottom. We have expert opinions or editorials, and we kind of move upward um, through stronger and stronger study designs until we get to the top. So when looking at data, it's important for us to consider the study sample, the method of measures, the timing of the measures, as well as any interventions.